And let's move on now to Victoria Strait, whose talk title is Stellar Populations of Galaxies in the Cosmic Dawn with HST and Spitzer. So Victoria, go ahead and share your slides and you can unmute yourself when you're ready. Hi, can you all see that and hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris and Aswin for those nice talks. Uh, I'm Victoria and I'm gonna be talking about uh, observations of galaxies at Redshift 6 and above using Hubble and Spitzer, you know, to try to see what we can learn before JWST. So the question I'm trying to answer that informs a lot of other questions in astronomy is what do the galaxies in the epic of reionization look like? Uh, and pardon this really basic mini lit review, but locally we can see lots of details in galaxies like disks and outflows of gas and spirals. Uh, if we take a step back to redshift point one and even farther back to redshift two, the picture gets quite a bit fuzzier. Uh, we lose sort of this nice picture of structure that we had. And then when we get to redshift six and seven, where I start to be able to look at galaxies, um, we mostly see point sources or in some cases just red fuzzy blobs. Uh, so we, this gets a lot harder to glean information from these galaxies. And then at redshift eight to 10, this, the picture is sort of the same, but the red fuzzy blobs are fewer because these things are fainter and the intergalactic medium is absorbing uh, a lot of the light. So the way that one goes about characterizing a population of galaxies that we can't see very well is uh, with surveys. Um, so there are several examples of lensing and flat field surveys uh, that take different techniques. The one that I'm working with is called the Reionization Cluster Lensing Survey, or RELICS. Um, the, unlike the Hubble Frontier Fields, which has taken really deep Hubble data of just a few fields, RELICS has taken a different approach. Uh, we've surveyed 41 massive galaxy clusters in order to try to find sort of the brighter uh, high redshift candidates that might be um, more rare that might not need as much Hubble data. So we have a 188 H HST uh, orbit program PI'd by Dan Co, um, along with over a thousand hours of Spitzer data uh, PI'd by my advisor, Marisha Bradach. Uh, and here you can see the clusters we, we targeted in their Planck mass. They're all sort of the, the most high mass ones. Um, the science that we're doing in RELICS is mostly high redshift galaxies, but there are also people working on lensing, uh, doing supernova searches and working on galaxy cluster scaling relations. So of course I'm focusing on the high redshift sample in RELICS. Um, there are over 300, I think 321 HST selected high redshift candidates. This is a figure from Brett Salmon from a few years ago that shows the apparent magnitude and redshift and then absolute magnitude over here. These are photometrically selected with Hubble. So they don't have spectroscopic redshifts. They're just selected with the Lyman break technique. And you can see that um, they span from redshift 5.5 to about 10 and several orders of magnitude in, in uh, brightness. Uh, before I go on, I just wanted to say that Danco has a student, Brian Welch, who's working on uh, characterizing the properties of three really cool objects from the sample who, that are the brightest redshift six candidate, which is an arc, the longest redshift six arc, and the most distant arc, which is actually a redshift 10. So there are also a lot of spectroscopic follow-up programs going on for the RELIC sample, in particular my group in Davis is looking at these things with Keck. Um, and generally we're looking for one emission line, Lyman alpha, uh, which gives us a redshift and tells us maybe something about the galaxy. But even when we know a redshift, um, we, we need something else in order to say anything about the physical properties of the galaxy. We need uh, to constrain the rest frame optical part of the, the spectrum. And so we can only basically only do this with Spitzer right now for high redshift galaxies. So I'm gonna show this with an example from the cluster AVAL 370. This is observed magnitude and wavelength. The black points are my data and the blue points, uh, the blue line in the back is a best fit uh, template. So these wavelengths are probed by Hubble and uh, the rest frame the, the rest frame optical wavelengths over here are probed by Spitzer uh, and you can see the, 
the Redshift, the Redshift PDF in the corner there. So if I do the same thing, but only with Hubble Fluxes, this is the best fit and template that, that fits the data pretty well. Here's another example of that and another one and another one. Uh, so maybe you can see my point that with HST data alone, uh, we get quite a large distribution uh, when we're using SED fitting only to, um, to get the stellar properties of this. So this is stellar mass, star formation rate, age, specific star formation rate spanning, couple orders of magnitude. Um, however, when we add Spitzer, uh, it's more data points, but it's also the rest frame optical, which holds a lot of information about these things. So the distributions get quite a lot smaller. So with that in mind, uh, my job has been to add Spitzer to the relic sample for the 300 galaxies that already have HSD data. And I'm just gonna highlight a few cool galaxies that we've found. Uh, the first one is a spatially resolved H uh, Redshift 10 candidate first discovered by Brett Salmon. This is a photo of it. And this is his plot, linear flux and wavelength. You can see the two Spitzer fluxes here are straddling the Balmer break. Since then, we've gotten deeper data and we've been able to push upper limits down from about here to, uh, to quite a bit deeper. Um, and since then, uh, you, you can actually see the, maybe you can see this, the um, dotted line here is the P of Z before we had Spitzer and the, the solid line here is after Spitzer. So really the Spitzer fluxes here are what um, caused us to do, you'll see in a second, more, more follow-up with HST on this object. But, we were able to do SED fitting with a couple of different sets of assumptions and get an idea of its uh, physical properties. Since then, uh, we have gotten more HST data. So this is what it used to look like. And you can see uh, several more clumps now. Um, and I haven't analyzed these data myself, but Dan Co has. And this the the cool result from this is that the hst data alone um prefer redshift 10 solution strongly uh even without spitzer so you can see the the red line here and the red boxes uh are the low redshift fit and the the blue one is the high redshift fit uh which which fits much better and there's a very peaky p of z here the second cool object is uh, this one behind cluster AVAL 1763, which shows evidence of an evolved stellar population at redshift eight, or as evolved as it can be at redshift eight. Um, the Spitzer fluxes that I'm highlighting here are also straddling Balmer break, uh, which is basically just showing light from old stars, um, and meaning that this galaxy is quite old. Uh, you can see this, this peak in the age distribution around right before redshift right before 10 to the nine. Um, and this is implying quite an early formation time, uh, less than hundred million years after the big bang. And the most recent thing we found is a very strong Lyman alpha uh, emitter that we've named dichromatic primeval galaxy, DP7. Uh, this is something Deborah Polici and I are working on. Uh, we found that the equivalent width is between two and 400 angstroms and you can see the SED fit over here. It's, it's looking uh, quite old as well. Um, after we, we got this detection with LRIS, uh, we looked again at the HST data to see sort of what was going on because it's sort of unexpected that you'd have such a booming Lyman alpha with a, an old stellar population. And um, we usually use F160 as the detection image, but we found that in several of the other images, there were actually two components. Um, and so you can see a very red component here in the south and a much bluer component in the north. Um, and we were able to separate these in HST for all the bands and measure the UV spectral slope. Um, and we got a very blue negative four plus or minus two at the top and a very red positive three plus or minus two in, in this other component. So this strongly supports there being multiple stellar populations. Um, our current theory for the galaxy is that it it's pretty old, but it's experiencing some sort of rejuvenation process happening in the northern component. Uh, so yeah, for this galaxy, one stellar population fit is not necessarily the best. Uh, the way that we do SED fitting is um, maybe not the, the most appropriate here because it has uh, two different um, stellar populations. Unfortunately, we couldn't um, separate out the Spitzer fluxes for this object. Uh, but those three galaxies are the R3 
uh, some examples of um, three objects that we paid special attention to in the sample of 300 galaxies. Um, but just to give you some diagnostic plots of the entire sample um, that we'll be coming out with a full catalog uh, of Spitzer fluxes and stellar properties on for people to play with. I'm sure there are other lots of other cool galaxies for you all to find in there. Um, I was able to recover Spitzer fluxes for 208 of these and uh, 23 were likely demoted to low redshift. Um, and this paper should be done and out pretty soon. Um, so I will wrap up there. All right, thank you very much, Victoria. So we have some questions. Um, question from Rebecca Bowler who asks, how do you know that the red component in DP7 is at the same redshift? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, we are kind of making the assumption that the, the galaxy, the components are so close together. It's, um, I don't remember off the top of my head, 0.2 arc seconds or so. So we're, we're kind of thinking that um, it would, it would be kind of crazy for, for galaxies to be overlapping in space like that. But um, the, the, SEDs of, of each individual component both look like they're at 7. Okay, and then a follow-up on that object from Asami Uchi. He's curious about the Lyman Alpha mission line. He says it looks broad. What is the line width? Is there any possibility that this is an AGN? Hmm. I, I don't know that off the top of my head. Deborah's the one that did this, um, this uh, um, emission line uh, analysis, but I think that's a, a nice idea to look into. I'm not sure. OK. And um, let's see. So a question from Tom Thunes, who asks, how sensitive are your SED fits to getting the nebular emission lines right in the modeling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's especially a problem for this one, because um, O3 lands right in the middle of channel 2 for this object. Um, we, we include strong emission lines in our SED fitting. Um, up to 2,000 and some odd angstroms for, for uh, rest frame O3. Um, and still, um, we're getting an old, uh, old solution here. Of course, if we didn't include emission lines, we would, this would be even more strongly preferred. So the answer is that it is sensitive. And you can see that there are some uh, young solutions that my SED fitting is finding here. But uh, we believe that we're pretty agnostic. Okay, I'm going to use Chair's prerogative and ask a follow up. How, um, I mean, the, the results must be sensitive to how well you're deep blending the IRAC photometry. Is, do you have any sense of the systematic uncertainty there, especially for objects like the one you're showing, which are right on the, the wings of a nearby bright source? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we, I don't know a number for a systematic uncertainty, but yeah, definitely the way that we're doing Spitzer photometry is very sensitive to. Um, the, the bright sources nearby, but we do do a lot of testing on these uh, Spitzer fluxes to make sure that we believe them. Um, and for this this one in particular, um, the the fact that it's showing up in channel two and not in channel one with the same uh, same bright source there uh, is is why I believe this. Um, yes, but certainly <laughs> certainly bright objects can can get in the way. All right, um, one final question um, from Rohan Naidu who asks, what's your interpretation of the positive beta slope? What kind of ages or dust do you need? Uh, yeah, I don't know the actual numbers for how much dust we would need for that. We're currently working on this project, um, but I think that that's pretty reminiscent of something like this SED fit here, which looks um, fairly dusty. And I think that the, the reddening was, around one, like the EB minus B was around one, if I remember correctly. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much, Victoria.